In video 97 of Tensor Calculus, we'll follow up the last video with a specific example of a parallel transport. What we're going to do is build on the demo we did in video 94. We're going to parallel transport a vector t along the circle that's embedded in the spherical surface. So we'll begin by recalling our expression for the parallel transport, and we'll use this form. Our parameter value for the embedded circle is the coordinate value phi, so I've expressed this relationship using phi instead of lambda. Well, the first thing we want to do is to take a look at this particular factor right here. The uh, derivative of s beta with respect to phi. Well, what is the derivative of s1 with respect to phi? Well, S1 is the surface coordinate value from the pole to the lower pole, or it's the value of theta. And in our case here for the circle, theta is a constant. So this derivative is equal to 0. Well, what about ds2 with respect to phi? Well, phi is the uh, coordinate value S2 that goes around this way. So the derivative of S2 with respect to phi is just 1, because S2 is phi. So this is a value of 1. So what this tells us is that uh, we can ignore any terms down here where the value of beta is equal to 1. And when the value of beta is 2, then this uh, factor is just going to be 1. So we can just to take it out of the equation and only express it using the values for 2 for beta. So let's expand this expression out uh, in its full form, ignoring these factors and replacing these with a value of 1. So normally when we expand this out, we'd expect to have four terms. There are two dummy indexes, beta and omega, so that gives us four terms. But again, we can ignore the terms where beta is equal to 1 because of this. So we're only interested in those terms that have a value of 2 for beta in this position. And of course, the factor in front of each of these terms is 1 because of uh, this relationship up here. In video 70, we derived the values for the Christoffel symbol for a spherical surface. We found that these two were 0, and this guy right here was negative sine theta cosine theta. And this guy over here was equal to cosine theta divided by sine theta. So we can make these substitutions. These, then, are the differential equations we need to solve. What we have is a pair of coupled differential equations. By coupled, we mean that both of these equations involve both t1 and t2. Well, how would you go about solving something like this? Well, you do it by taking the derivative of this expression with respect to phi, and then you'd solve for the uh, derivative of t2 with respect to phi and substitute that in right here. That would eliminate t2 from the expression, giving us a second order ordinary differential equation with t1 as the only variable. You could solve that for t1. Then you'd repeat the process the other way. You'd take this derivative with respect to phi, solve for dt1 with respect to phi, substitute that back here, and that'll give you a second order differential equation in t2, and you can solve that one. Turns out that both of them are the well-known expressions for simple harmonic motion. You can solve those and uh, apply the initial conditions, and you'll come up with the solution you want. So um, this is a series on tensor calculus and not differential equations. So rather than go through all that, I'm just going to give you the solutions. And here are the solutions. So we find that, remember, theta is a constant. 
So cosine theta is a constant, so we set cosine theta equal to omega, and that becomes what we call the angular velocity in this argument right here. So uh, what you'll find, and, and you can do this on your own, you can substitute these values into these two expressions and see that it satisfies both of these equations. You can also see that these forms uh, give us the proper initial conditions. When phi is equal to 0, t1 is equal to 0. When phi is equal to 0 here, t2 is equal to 1 over a sine theta. Now, we want that as the initial condition because the basis vector for our curve has a magnitude of a sine theta. So this being the initial condition for t2, means that we're dealing with a unit vector. T is going to be a unit vector, and to make it a unit vector, we have to have an initial vector component of 1 over a sine theta. The final step is to form a linear combination. Our vector t is going to be equal to the contraction of t alpha with the surface basis vectors s alpha. Well, of course, that expands out this way. It's t1 times basis vector S1 plus T2 times basis vector S2. Well, this is what we derived for our basis vectors back in video number 61. So all we have to do now is to make the direct substitutions. We we'll substitute T1 and T2 here and here. We we'll substitute S1 and S2 here and here and collect the terms and uh, organize the final result. Now, I'm not going to go through all of that because it's just algebra. I'll let you do that. But here's the final result. When we form the linear combination, we find that our vector t is equal to this full expression right here. Notice that our vector t is a function of phi. Phi is the only variable in this expression. Everything else is a constant. Remember, uh, theta is a constant here, and omega right here is uh, simply the cosine of theta. All right, um, there are a couple of things you can do to kind of uh, give yourself a sanity check here. Let's set the value of uh, phi equal to 0. And if we do that, then this term is 0, this is 0, this one is 0, uh, this is 0, and this one right here is equal to 1. Okay, um, that means that when phi is equal to 0, our vector t is equal to y hat. It's a unit vector pointing in the y hat direction. That's the initial condition for our vector. Now, the other thing you can do is to find the dot product of t with itself. If you squared this, squared this, squared this, add those three squares together, simplify it, you'll find that the result is equal to 1. And that tells us the magnitude of t is 1. It's a unit vector, irrespective of the value of phi. So throughout the parallel transport process, the vector is going to maintain its magnitude of 1. OK, um, so let's uh, take this result and substitute it into our graphing software and see what it looks like. All right, well, here we've got our curve, this circle that's embedded in a spherical surface. So what I'm going to do now is to display the vector that we've been dealing with, this um, tangent vector right here. This is a tangent vector at a value of phi equals 0. It's tangent to the curve, and it's a unit vector pointing to the right like this. So let's watch what happens as we move the point. We're going to transport this vector. We're going to do a parallel transport. OK, as we move, watch what happens to the vector. The vector begins to turn to the right. So what's going on here? Why is it changing to the right? Well, remember that we're not um, working with a geodesic here. This, this circle is not a geodesic. We demonstrated in the last uh, demo that when we move along this curve, we're actually turning to the left. So uh, really, it's not the vector that's changing. It's the line that's changing. Because we're changing our direction to the left as we move, the vector is adjusting itself to remain parallel to itself as we go. Now, maybe it's a little easier to see if we'll line up these points the way we did before. So I'll put this one 
right over that one. And notice as I move our point that we're actually turning to the left here, but watch what happens to the vector. See, the vector remains parallel to itself as we move. Well, that's the whole idea. We turn left to right, then the vector has to change its direction to remain parallel to itself. But of course, it's uh, constrained to the tangent plane. So let's put that up a minute. You'll see that, that our point is always in the tangent plane and our vector, vector t, is always located in the tangent plane no matter where it goes. All right, um, maybe it's a little easier to see if I put up a set of these things all at the same time. So I've constructed this. Um, we can see uh, examples of what this vector looks like at various points. And if we just kind of angle around here, you can see from each angle that this vector is parallel to this one. If we move around, this vector is parallel to this one. Move over here, this one's parallel to this one, and so on. So as we move along the curve, the vector remains parallel to itself, at least where directions right and left are concerned. All right, um, so next thing is let's um, change the value of theta. Theta is set to 60 degrees here, so let me change it to 90 degrees. And you know that when we reach a value of 90 degrees, we've got a great circle. And a great circle, of course, is a geodesic. So look at what the vectors look like now. See, they're not uh, having to adjust right or left because as we travel on a geodesic, the vector that's tangent to the curve here will remain tangent to the curve all along the way because we're not turning right or left and the vector doesn't have to shift to adjust for it. And of course, if we make the angle larger than 90, then everything reverses and we're turning to the right and the vector has to shift left to remain parallel to itself. All right, so hopefully uh, that gives you a good visual representation of what we mean by parallel transport. In the next video, we're going to make use of the parallel transport as we introduce the topic of holonomy.